My name is Yunong, and I uh, am a graduate student from uh, University of Chicago at French Hans Group. I uh, come from the same group as Jonathan. So I spent my last year in IBM uh, designing uh, quantum uh, compilers and uh, uh, designing uh, uh, protocols for uh, alternative qubit architecture. So today I'm, talk, uh, I'm going to talk about how we as a computer scientist can help with uh, building the first generation of uh, quantum computers. Okay. So compared to uh, what uh, Jonathan had uh, presented, my, uh, to um, my topics will be more higher level, so not, uh, not going to be that uh, come to the uh, details. Okay, so first, uh, before we uh, come to our topic, so I want to uh, give a very brief uh, review of the uh, history of classical computing. So the classical computing uh, actually starts from the 1950s. So at that time, people know what they want. So they want to compute uh, the trajectory of missiles, and, uh, and they have impl uh, physical implementations, they have uh, relay circuits, they have uh, vacuum tubes. However, what's in between is um, it's nothing. So they directly input their uh, algorithms into the, uh, into the uh, physical implementation. And um, so moving forward, to, um, move, moving forward to now, and we, now we have this nicely layered approach between uh, the algorithms and uh, phys physical implementation. Um, and this is mainly because that we want, because the <coughs> technology is moving too fast that we want to manage the complexity so that we have higher language, uh, have a higher le level language, we have compiler to, for ex expressiveness, and then we have architectural level and gates and uh, the physical implementations. And uh, as the Moore's law is uh, getting slower down, uh, slowing down, we're seeing a transition from the layered approach to a more vertically integrated approach between the, lab, uh, between the uh, algorithm and the logic implement implementation. For example, we're seeing the TPUs, GPU accelerated uh, computing, and we're seeing um, FPGAs uh, helping in the between. So the question now we're having is that we all know that a quantum computing is at, er at, is at its early stage, it's just as the uh, classical computing in the 1950s. So questions now we're at, trying to ask is that how will the uh, software uh, chain change. Is, 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 uh, are we going to see a transition just like the classic computing in the 1950s to nowadays, or what are we uh, expecting? So the answer we're having is actually the transition, transition is going to be different. Uh, there are several uh, this difference between quantum computing now and the classic computing in the 1950s. Uh, the, there are several advantages of quantum computing. First, the theory of quantum computing has been there for, almost, uh, for more than 20 years. So uh, it was uh, in 1940, uh, 90, 1984 that Richard Feynman first uh, bring, uh, bringing the uh, concept of quantum computers. And uh, over the uh, 30 years of uh, development, we have a very large portion of quantum theory being built up. And uh, quantum computing is heavily uh, dependent on classical control system, and we have, we have a very sophisticated uh, classical control techniques. If we want to control something, we're probably gonna build it very easily. So, that's, uh, so uh, that means that the uh, quantum computing software to, uh, stack is looking very similar to the uh, software stack we're having now uh, in quantum, uh, classical computing. So we have apps, applications, and we have higher language. So all the big companies, uh, for example, IBM and Google, they have their own uh, software packages, uh, for example, Qiskit and Circ. Uh, we have compilers. Um, here, uh, com uh, compilation is, uh, means a diff uh, technically means a different thing uh, for com quantum computing, and it's born with the computation. So, it, so we need to have compilation uh, in the very beginning of uh, quantum computing, and I'll, I'll talk in details later. Um, then we have classical control, and oh, we also have the abstraction of gates and register. Then we have very noisy uh, physical implementations. Uh, however, the biggest disadvantage that a quantum computing that I have uh, is that the qubits that we're building now is much less uh, reliable than the uh, classical bits we're building in uh, we were building in 1950s. And it's possible that we're never going to be built uh, quantum bits as reliable as the classical bits we're having now. So 
that doesn't mean that a quantum computing is, a computer is not going to be built because uh, the, uh, theory of, uh, the theory of quantum error correction tells us with enough layers of encoding that we always can suppress our error rates to arbitrarily uh, low level. Okay, so we can, we can uh, theoretically, we can still build a quantum computing a computer, but uh, it's that we ca can't imagine our quantum computer will scale as fast as, uh, as the classical uh, computers in the 1950s. So the short-term goals that we have for our software uh, tool chain is that we want to make more uh, useful applications with the scarce quantum resources that we have. So the trans transition that we're going to see is probably going to be very similar to the transition that we're seeing nowadays in the classic computing world. So we're, we're trying, we're probably will see a lot of vertically integrated approach between the higher level and the lower level. So in today's talk, I'm going to talk about how, how do we find better applications for the near-term quantum computing, and how do we uh, design the software and the hardware uh, interface so that we have, we have better efficiency. And uh, I'm going to talk about how do we find better physical um, architectures that will help us um, do more useful uh, uh, applications. Okay, here is the, first we talk about um, applications. I'm just gonna repeat this uh, slides of uh, uh, Jonathan's. So for <coughs> near-term applications, we have this following uh, requirements. So last three, the last three are for general quantum computation um, because uh, we, uh, the I.O. problem for um, quantum computing uh, application is always going to be there. Because um, just like uh, classical computing, we have uh, I.O. problems. But for classical computing, the I.O. Uh, uh, slowdown uh, is like a constant. So for example, we always have like maybe 400 times slowdown for the hardware, between the hardware and uh, um, a RAM. However, the, the I.O. problem could be exponential in quantum computing. So we want a very compact uh, problem representation, and we also want to show very high complex uh, um, computation, and we also want it to be a compact uh, solution that we can read out very easily. And the first two points are for near-term quantum, uh, quantum computing. We want it only new, uh, use noisy qubits, and we want it only use uh, short uh, circuit depth, and this can be, could be done with co-processing with uh, classical computers, possibly supercomputers. And we also want it to uh, have very easily uh, verifiable solution. Because in the, uh, in the near term, we're not going to be sh very sure about our solution. Because uh, we're not sure if we're, uh, our uh, quantum computers is going to be very reliable. So the first two points are for the um, uh, near term quantum com uh, computation. Okay. So I'm going to talk about several killer apps that we're having uh, right now for quantum computing. The first one is um, the quantum supremacy test. So this is the one that gets a lot of people excited. Is that uh, we want to uh, the definition of quantum supremacy test is that we want to find out a computational task, not necessarily not necessarily useful, and we want to give it to a quantum computer and give it to a classic computer. And to show that only the quantum computer can solve this problem in a reasonable uh, in a reasonable time, so um, so there are a lot of uh, proposal for uh, quantum supremacy. So today I'm going to uh, briefly introduce the one that uh, proposed by Google, which is mostly influential. So the quantum supremacy test of Google proposed is uh, based on sampling. Okay. So uh, just as uh, Jonathan just, uh, just uh, introduced, we could have uh, quantum, uh, quantum circuits, and we can read out, so let's say we have uh, quantum circuits of n strings, n bits, uh, of n quantum bits. And we can, if we do a, a computation, and we read out the, uh, the bits, so we can read out n bit string. And uh, there are two to the n possibilities, okay, that we can read out. And, uh, uh, quantum supremacy test that proposed by Google is that if we give you a random circuit description, uh, possibly larger than three, 
so it's probably uh, more than 50. Okay, so will you be able to tell me for a certain string, let's say xi, maybe 1, 0, 0, 1, or et cetera, and then can you tell me the probability of getting xi is larger than getting half of the strings? So it's basically asking if xi is reaches the medium uh, household income of America or something like that. So with some harness assumption, that classical computer can never do it without fully simulating the whole circuit. Okay, and uh, fully uh, simulating a, a whole quantum circuit of 50 qubits might require um, uh, the memory that we are not be able to build today. Okay, so if our quantum computer can uh, give that solution, that we can say that uh, the supremacy, uh, then we reached uh, quantum supremacy, and that would be a milestone for quantum computers. However, um, we still are maybe several years away from achieving this goal. Basically, there's uh, several reasons. First, it, requires, it still requires a little bit more resource that we need. So we need like more than 50 uh, qubits. And as the more and more, uh, as more and more classical simulation techniques is uh, emerging, and uh, the, that number is increasing. So some 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 company like Alibaba they can uh, simulate like 80, qubit, 80, 80 qubits, and uh, also the solution is not that easy to verify actually. So to verify your com quantum computer actually produced some results that. Um, um, uh, it, uh, can tell you that some certain string have the probability uh, more than half of the other strings. You actually have to produce the whole population, which is two to the 50, two to the maybe 60, and um, it will be a, a very long process. So we have a very long, a very, uh, we have a slowdown at the reading out, okay? Exponential uh, slowdown. So st still, this is not the, First application we should do, but it should be a milestone where we'll be aiming for. Okay. So another killer app of uh, quantum computers, and uh, which is also the first application that Richard Feynman had in mind when he was conceiving the uh, um, concept of quantum computing in 1984, is the quantum chemistry problems. Okay, uh, so it also is very useful. So it has potential to change a lot of the part of the, uh, of the society, for example, uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, industry. So stripping, um, stripping away all the physics, uh, phys physics that uh, the problem of uh, quantum chemistry is usually um, finding the ground state energy of the um, quantum system. And uh, by that, I mean, it's the, basically to find out the smallest eigen state, uh, eigenvalue of a very large matrix. Okay, that's the uh, problem that we encounter a lot in uh, computer science. And it's a very special kind of uh, matrix that we're dealing with. So usually the matrix we met uh, in quantum chemistry are matrix that can be uh, written as a uh, sum of very small matrix, uh, possibly two by two or four by four. So the formula uh, above here, each C alpha is a, like a coefficient, it's a real number or complex number, and uh, uh, sigma alpha, sigma betas are two by two matrix. So usually uh, your uh, quantum chemistry matrix are written in all these local uh, uh, interactions. Okay, so for example, there, th this is a, icing, a 1D icing chain with the near, uh, nearest neighbor uh, uh, interaction, and the uh, matrix looks like that. Okay, this, this one is uh, exactly solvable on a classical computer, but uh, just giving an example. Okay, so um, the quantum computer, uh, quantum, uh, quantum computing way of doing this is actually simulated on a quantum computer. So uh, before we dive into this, we pro I'll probably give an analogy. So is that, try to think of another uh, question, which is um, uh, that if you want to find the shortest path of two nodes on a certain graph, okay? So in a classic computer, you're trying to use some like a shortest path algorithm to find it. And the quantum computing way is very similar to, you actually use rope to make that graph in your real life, okay? You have some nodes, vertexes, you have some edges, it's just using rope, and you're just holding the two nodes in your hands and stretch it. 
And the first pass that gets it straight will be the one that's be the shortest, be the shortest. Okay, so here is very similar. So we have a very complicated chemistry system. And uh, the quantum computing way of doing it is that we simulate it on our co quantum computer and actually reading out uh, the um, uh, answer directly. Okay, uh, a slight difference here is that even giving you the path here, that to read out the length is very, uh, very hard. So it's different from the graph uh, example, okay? But uh, all the rest are very uh, similar. So if we have a chemistry uh, system, we map it to uh, qubits. So, and this map is uh, generally non-trivial, actually. Uh, non-trivial, actually. Because uh, chemistry students were usually uh, very interested in uh, electrons, and those are fermionic particles, and the qubits are like bosonic uh, uh, particles. So there is a non-trivial mapping. And then we digitize the uh, evolution of the system, and uh, we build up a, a quantum circuit to uh, simulate, simulate the evolution. And then we we're going to use some um, quantum algorithm called quantum phase estimation. That's, that's equivalent to the stretching part. Then that part is actually very complicated, and then we can directly read out the ground state energy. Okay? Um, so because uh, this is a traditional way or standard way of doing quantum chemistry problems, and uh, because of the quantum phase estimation part is very um, uh, resource intensive, so we probably need a million scales, million uh, um, qubits to do that, the near-term uh, approach to this problem is called a variational quantum eigensolver. So still use that, that example is that because um, the reading out is so hard, we can't read, uh, read out every path, and uh, the uh, graph is uh, uh, so big that we cannot build up uh, uh, all at once, so that we built up a subgraph each at once and use classical optimization to tell us which part of which uh, part of the big graph we should look at next okay so it's a it transfer some of uh, some of the computational tasks to the classical processor okay so this is a perfect example of um, near term uh, application we just need to use a very small part of the uh, um, uh, quantum, uh, quantum uh, computer which gives us some feedback and we use classical computers to um, optimize and to direct it to find the next uh, area that we're, we're interested in. Okay? So the algorithm will look like this. So we have a uh, classical optimization algorithm. We parameterize the state that we want to try and we send the state to the quantum kernel and let it try to see if it's a minimum energy, energy and, if, uh, and compare with the previous trials too. And it will uh, give back the energy for, to you and a classical optimi uh, optimizer will use all the energies it receives and the, to find out which the next one we're looking at, we're going to look at. So I'm going to give a very simple example. So let's say it, uh, we have one, one we parameterize our uh, quantum states uh, using a single uh, the, uh, angle theta. And we're starting from the red circle. And uh, the quantum computer will tell us, oh, the, uh, the energy will be on ar around nine, okay? And we're trying next one. And it tells us, oh, it's between six and three, okay? We're gonna try another one at nine, six. And, and go on, go on, and we will we're, we're, uh, we're reach the minimum energy, okay? So comparing to this uh, traditional way, we're um, using much, much less uh, quantum resource. Okay, so uh, that's uh, a variational uh, eigensolver. And another killer app that people were, uh, were hoping to see on quantum computer is optimization, particularly, particularly actually uh, quantum, qu quantum machine learning. So in theory, there are a lot of uh, 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 machine learning um, gadgets or uh, some modules that we can use uh, quantum to uh, speed up e exponentially. However, there's a lot of uh, I.O. problems as we uh, just uh, speak about. Um, so to, how to load up your um, 
data into a, a, onto a quantum computer. So if you can compute it like a, exponentially fast, however, if you can't load up the uh, um, data onto it uh, in a very short time, it's still not gonna, uh, gonna work, okay? So today I'm not going to talk about quantum machine learning algorithms because the IO problem is not uh, solved. I'm going, to talk, talk about, I'm going to talk about an easier one, which is very promising in the um, near term. It's called a, a quantum approximate optimization algorithm, it's, uh, or a, a QAOA, okay? I'm, I'm going to talk about how to use QAOA to uh, solve the max cut problem, okay? Just a, as an example. So for the max cut uh, problem is that we want to find out uh, a cut for a graph so that it will cut the uh, most, um, um, the, uh, uh, the maximum number of edges, okay? We can also review, uh, view, it, uh, view it as a coloring problem. So to cut a graph into two half, uh, that means also means like to color the nodes uh, with two colors. We can color one part as red and the other part as blue. And uh, in, so then we can encode this in quantum computer. So uh, for example, we can let each node of the graph to be a qubit. And uh, a conf one configuration or one conf uh, cut could be represented as uh, the, uh, all the nodes on the left of the cut will be uh, zero and all the nodes on the right could be, uh, would be um, one, okay? So we, we can re uh, pr uh, represent this configuration easily. And uh, then we ha have to encode our cost function, okay? So for each edge on, uh, on the graph, we assign it a matrix, which is uh, like we can think of it as a gate. Uh, uh, particularly, we're gonna use this uh, sigma z as our building block. So sigma z, uh, for sigma z, um, both zero and one are its eigenstates, okay? And they are eigenvalues are one and minus one, okay? For zero is one and for one is minus one, okay? So let's say if we have a um, edge between A and B, okay? So we're adding to our cost function a term like this, Hij, okay? And uh, I, I is an identity uh, matrix which will always evaluate to one. And uh, if we have uh, uh, two different colorings, which is zero and one, then it will give us, um, then its eigenvalue will be one and minus one, okay? Then that the second term will give us a minus one because one times minus one is minus one. And the whole thing will give us a two over two, which is one. So that means that th this configuration we cut between A and B. So we're adding that one to our cost function. And uh, if they're the same assign, then one minus one will be give us zero. So then this way we can encode our problem into a, a quantum gate and, if, and doing the same thing with the VQE, we can uh, like variationally solve this problem and uh, we can um, find the uh, lowest uh, energy uh, of this cost function or highest. Okay, so that's a QAOA um, algorithm. Okay, so the next part I would talk about how to uh, vertically integrate our uh, software stack between algorithm and uh, physical implementation. And the next one is uh, where I'm going to talk about is quantum compilation. So quantum compilation is defined as broadly as translating the high-level uh, high description of your quantum program uh, to your uh, executable circuits on your device, okay? It's, this is a very mathematical problem. Um, so in 1997, uh, uh, mathematician uh, KDF and uh, Solovey, they independently solved this problem. So this basically, this problem is how to decompose your big matrix as a sum of some uh, small uh, tensor product of uh, small matrices. And uh, this, they have this brilliant uh, result that you can always, uh, uh, no matter what's your big matrix, as long as it's a unitary, which is uh, required by quantum, 
then you can always decompose it uh, uh, as tensor products of uh, and a four by four and a two by two matrices, which is that we've, we can physically uh, physically implement. Okay, and over the uh, over the years, uh, this uh, process is, is um, um, uh, the concept of quantum, quantum compilation is uh, actually expanded. Okay, here's an example of how we uh, decompose a uh, swap gate. So for example, if we have C0 gates, we can uh, represent a um, swap gate using a three alternating C0 gates. There should be an equal sign in between. And uh, also, if we only have C0 gates in one direction, we can al always like, express it uh, with uh, four hard uh, hardware gates and C0 uh, uh, with a different uh, direction. Okay, so uh, after, server, uh, after 20 years of um, uh, pr uh, progress, our uh, compilation uh, uh, stack looks like this, okay? So this is a closer look uh, of the um, stack that's uh, between the higher level algorithm and the lower level of, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, implementation. We have, we have borrowed a lot of uh, classical techniques, for example, loop unrolling and the module flattening and uh, scheduling and mapping. So all, all of these uh, are uh, classical controls, okay? And uh, uh, next I want to uh, share um, recent research uh, that um, our lab actually did to actually optimize this layered appro uh, approach. Okay, so here uh, in this uh, in uh, in this uh, software stack, we're actually solving a very small optimization problem at a, uh, at, at a time, and we're hiding the phys the lower level um, details from the uh, <clears throat> from the higher levels, and uh, that's uh, so. This is good for manage uh, for managing uh, uh, complexity. However, it is not actually good for making it more efficient, okay? So we're proposing a new tool that actually can help us uh, to optimize this process uh, a lot, which is using the quantum control theory. So ultimately, what's going on uh, um, after, uh, behind the gates is actually a continuous evolution, okay? So as Jonathan just uh, introduced, uh, qubits can be represented on a block sphere, and each gate is actually a linear transformation of the uh, mm, uh, vectors on the block sphere. And what's going on actually behind it is, is uh, actually a continuous evolution of the uh, vectors on the block sphere. And um, so to optimize the gates or uh, decomposition is actually to optimize uh, continuous evolution uh, behind, um, uh, underneath, okay? Uh, this is a picture of uh, a real uh, su uh, superconducting computer, uh, superconducting quantum computer in University of Chicago. Okay, then, so basically what we're trying to do is actually uh, solving a matrix problem. How to find a, a parameterized matrix evolution path that we're going, uh, then, then we can optimize, so make the whole circuit shorter, so that we can fit in more applications into, in, into a very short-lived uh, QB lifetime. Okay, so the uh, techniques we're using is uh, called a grip algorithm. So it's a, grad it, uh, it's a gradient ascent pulse engineering. So basically what it does is uh, using part of the TensorFlow uh, tool from Google, and uh, for the matrix we're having, we're actually building a computational graph for it, and we try to find its gradient in this high dimensional uh, 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 space. And uh, we do uh, back propagation and uh, update our pulse uh, accordingly so that we can drive our quantum uh, system to the desired state that we need. For example, the desired state could be from zero to one uh, or some other uh, superpositions. Okay, this is how GRAPE uh, actually works uh, in the realistic setting. So we have some physical, uh, physical model that we fit into the uh, 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 GRAPE uh, system and uh, let it uh, try to do a gradient descending and uh, 
help us find the uh, mm, path that gives us the best uh, uh, qubit fidelity. Okay. So on the left is the error rate uh, with it, a number of iteration. On the left, uh, on the right is the actual pulse, uh, pulse shape. So pulse is actually the uh, micro, um, uh, <coughs> microwave. Uh, my microwave signal that you're sending to the physical system, okay? So we can actually just use this pulse shape to drive our physical uh, wave generator. Okay, so uh, then we discuss how, how do we actually use optimal control to optimize our circuit. For optimal control to work, basically you will need the global information. So the more information it fits, uh, you, you feed it uh, to it, and the more optimization it can do for you. So the approach that we do for um, compilation is actually aggregate all the single two qubit and one qubit gates, and uh, um, send them uh, to optimal control altogether. So, we can use this as an example. Suppose we have four single qubit gates. On the block sphere, it could look like this, okay? It could uh, send you to random uh, positions on the block sphere. And however, if we aggregate them and send them to the optimum control altogether, it probably will find the shortest path for us so that our uh, uh, 30 depth will be much shorter. So here's the example of QLA algorithm that we just showed. This is the uh, uh, compilation from the traditional way, and that's the pulse uh, it generates. And this is the aggregated approach. And we can find that the pulse shape is much simpler, and the time is uh, three times shorter. Okay. Mm. Okay, the, the next topic I want to talk about is actually uh, better physical implementation. Um, first, I'm gonna uh, try to um, introduce the most popul uh, popular uh, uh, qubit impl implementation now uh, in qu uh, superconducting qubits. It's called transmon qubits. So it kind of rev revolutionized the, the quantum computing in the last 10 years. Um, so here's some uh, basic um, concept of it. So what, what a transmon qubit is actually a LC circuit. And um, so the circuit itself is a qubit. So, and um, uh, in classical uh, uh, <coughs> circuits, we know that the solution to a uh, LC circuit is, a, uh, uh, is the same solution to a pendulum. However, um, we use the superconducting super super LC circuit so that we quantize the LC circuit. Cor so correspondingly, the pendulum is also quantized. What it means is that now the pendulum can, o can only take server quantized energy level, which is uh, the height. Okay? Then um, each, uh, each energy level is represented by a wave function in the momentum, uh, in the position space. Okay? So how much you actually, um, uh, your, uh, the amplitude you are damping. Okay? And however, it's like a prob probabilistic because it's a quantum um, nature. Okay, so for each uh, energy level, it, it corresponds to a different uh, wave function, but they're all orthogonal. Okay, and uh, by using something called Josephson junction, so Josephson just Josephson junction, that we actually can slightly um, shift the energy level a little bit. The, so that the energy difference between each level is a little bit different, so we can selectively drive the qubit to jump between certain levels, not all of them, okay? So that's how um, super, superconducting qubits uh, work, okay? Um, the qubits will be the first two levels. The zero and one level will be the lowest two levels, and we use them as qubits. Actually, we'll have more levels to use if we want to do Q-treats or Q-dits, we can use them. And um, a recent uh, research that we um, collaborated with IBM is that um, we try to use a different architecture than the current one because 
uh, then we have to go to uh, the real implementation of Transmon, okay? The Transmon is actually the green boxes uh, in the, uh, on the circuit, so it's all printed circuits. And the two blue bars are transmission line, and it will protect uh, the circuit from outside noise, and it will also uh, give us direct control to the Transmon qubit, okay? The physical uh, interpretation of the uh, um, uh, transmission line is kind of like the trans transmission line is a uh, cavity and uh, uh, the transmon qubit is an uh, atom that's trapped in it, okay? So you're isolated from the outside, but it, oh, you, you can also control it by uh, control the cavity itself. Now there, there's a, a trend that we're trying to encode qubits actually not in the transmon itself, but uh, in a cavity. So there, was, there are several uh, advantages of this approach. So you have a long, much longer uh, lifetime for the qubits because the uh, cavity can um, live lo much longer. And uh, the cavity, you can, because it's a harmonic oscillator, so the pendulum, the, every energy level is the same. So you can actually encode your qubits in all the levels. And you can use some uh, smart encoding so that you can uh, do some active error correction. So the uh, research we ha had collaborated with IBM is uh, using uh, cavity qubits, and the encoding is called a Gossman uh, KDF uh, Prescale code. Um, it's a little bit technical, so I won't get into much uh, details, uh, details of it. So basically what we have is that we have this um, uh, amplitude uh, dimension, which is uh, correspond to, to the like, uh, amplitude of the pendulum. We all also have this uh, momentum space. Then, because of Heisenberg uh, uncertainty, we cannot be certain about both at the same time. So if we have error in both in the amplitude space and also the momentum space, we cannot correct them both. However, this encoding can avoid that in such a way. So as you can see, it's a, this encoding is a peak at integer multiple of some number, okay? and we can actually measure it without dis destroying it. So if we know that, let's say, it's um, um, multiple, uh, multiple, uh, in, uh, multiples of uh, uh, square root pi, and if we measure it, we know that it's, multiple, uh, it's a square root pi plus 0.1. We know that uh, the state is shifted by 0.1, and we can sh shift it back. However, statistically, we still are not very sure about this state because we could uh, measure square root pi, we could measure two square root pi, we could measure four square root pi. So we kind of like get over with the um, uh, Heisenberg uncertainty in both Q and P space, okay? And um, the contribution in our research is that we added some uh, near-term uh, technology to um, avoid errors, to uh, mitigate errors in circuits called flat qubits. So we, uh, this is a circuit to, for, to, uh, to prepare this state uh, uh, in the cavity. And we use the third qubit to detect the error. Uh, because, uh, uh, so I'll just say it uh, as a fact. If you have an X error after the uh, Hardamara gate uh, on the circuit, second qubit, it will actually um, prop, uh, propagate to the third, so third qubit. And it will detect it by the third qubit then if we have some error, we can detect it, and we will let it, uh, we will reject it and do it over again, okay? So that's my um, topic today. So I talk about better applications and um, domain-specific approach, how to vertically integrate our compilation and uh, better physical implementation. So, so kind of going back to that last, uh, last talk, uh, but each state is uh, two to the n implementation. It's exponentially large. Do you have any approximation method or something that can, um, the compact way you can represent each state? So uh, are you asking, uh, is there a, a way that we can compactly uh, represent the two to the n uh, vector in a classical way? Uh, so for certain uh, uh, states, it could be. Uh, but in general, if you want to do computation, 
So you have to make sure that you do that computation in that com compacted way. So you don't want to, uh, you, you want to uh, first uh, uh, compress it, but you don't want to decompress it and do compu computation, then compress it, right? Because then you, what's the point of compress it, right? So the hard part is that uh, doing computation in that uh, compressed way, is, if that makes sense. Is that your question? Yes. So, you, you, so, um, uh, so I guess my answer is that you can encode a large vector in, in a very compact way. However, you probably lose the, uh, uh, lose the um, uh, ability to actually do the quantum computation or simulate the quantum computation with that encoding. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.